Welcome everybody. This is our demo with Emmett Van Der Eich of his Spoon Challenge number 42, our Ruax Spoon Challenge 42. This is his ice, ice cream scoop template. Um, and I, before we get started, I just wanted to say a quick thanks to Sonny, because Sonny was the one who kind of initiated this with Emmett. And of course, yep. thank you, Emmett, for agreeing to let us uh, publish one of your uh, templates as our Ruax Spoon Challenge. Uh, and a huge thank you to Emmett for agreeing to let us record a demo of him carving this shape. Um, so with that, I'm going to spotlight Emmett and we'll get started. Um, Emmett, as you may know, is an amazing spoon carver. He's responsible for my getting back into spoon carving after having been on a hiatus for quite a few years. Um, He's uh, the author of uh, many really good books uh, on spoon carving and Christmas tree farming. And he's coming out soon with an um, apparently an amazing textbook on his all of his spoon carving process and wisdom and knowledge. Uh, Emmett's got a lot of fires in the hopper. Uh, Spoonosaurus Magazine, all the you know video work that he does. Uh, if you don't know Emmett, uh, you're, uh, where have you been? <laughs> so with that, Emmett, I'm going to ask you just to tell us a little bit about this ice cream scoop uh, shape, how you kind of came up with it and how it's evolved. And uh, yeah, that's it. Take it away. So, so I have my personal one right here. Um, so I originally started uh, making ice cream scoops because someone asked me to. And they said, have you ever made an ice cream scoop? And I said, no, but that seems like you wouldn't want to make one out of wood. And then as I started thinking about it more, I started thinking, you know, if you think about the classic metal ice cream scoop that they use in ice cream parlors, you actually could make it out of wood. And so I went and bought one at, at the store and, and looked at it. And it, it's fairly different from the way I do them now. But it gave me the general idea that, first of all, what you're looking at is an incredibly strong net. Um, which is the first thing that occurred to me, you know, doesn't make sense to do make it out of wood, but really it, the neck is so fat. Um, and this is the first form that I started doing these really fat handles with, which have since sort of come to, uh, they were so, they're so nice in the hand that I since started doing other forms, spatulas and spoons with, with handles that are this wide. Um, and then the second thing that I noticed about the metal um, ice cream scoops was that uh, there was a there was a lot of thickness right here in the bowl. So in the, the depth of the bowl is actually quite thick, and then it tapers to a, a nice thin edge. But it 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 doesn't taper shallowly. It tapers pretty strongly. So it's strong, you know, right up until that last quarter inch. Um, and and essentially that taper gives it tremendous strength. So um, it it really is impervious to to ice cream and, and, and actually works out quite beautifully. Um, I also realized, I recognized that the, it functions differently than any other spoon that we think of. Instead of, this one actually has slightly more crank than I would want. Um, it works okay, but, but really I'd want a few degrees less because when you think about when you're going into a container with ice cream tube, you're essentially jabbing down and then the wedging action of the, the thickening bowl shape. And then it comes up against this curve at the, the back of the bowl here, and that forces it to curl into a ball. And when mm. you're doing that downward wedging action, and then you need to be able to pry your way out and, and more crank than is absolutely necessary to get proper grain flow is really not helpful in that because it means that you have to cock your hand over too far. So you really want to be able to go straight down, get into it and then make curl as it comes out um, and so it's a different sort of uh it's a different sort of thing than than most other spoons it also having this this uh exit ramp at the back of the bowl here is also um it's very different than how i've come to do almost all of my spoons which don't tend to have that high back shoulder um and so there's just some, it's a little trickier when you're cleaning up the grain flow there. One of the reasons I don't tend to have that high back shoulder is because it creates a much wider area across which you're trying to clean up the, the grain as it changes. Um, and then I would say the, the last thing is that I used to do them with these strong facets on the handle and that is fun. Um, but 
when I did them for the Spoon of the Month Club, they, uh, the, in order to pull off big facets on this wide handle, the wood has to be mwah, absolutely perfect. And, and it doesn't accommodate, um, you know, areas where the grain wiggles and you might have some tear out. And so doing a handle that is sort of a loosely faceted curve on the front and the back with sort of the strong defined sides has come to be my more of my go-to thing because it's it's easier to accommodate. And the last thing I'll say is that the, the kick up from the handle to this high part of the back bowl here. Um, oh, I'll, I'll talk about that as I as I ax it, but essentially it's less than you think and it's easy to over exaggerate that. And really you could get away with not having that at all really all it does is it pulls the handle back down, but you could have it be a straight line from the end of the handle to this highest point and it'd be totally fine. You don't need that to define that kick up at the back of the bowl. Um, it's, it's sort of just what I happened to do. But then as I started axing more and more of them, I came to realize that one of the failure points was I would get stuck trying to navigate the grain change that I created right here on the neck. And so I just realized that you don't need to do it. And certainly when you're axing, you definitely don't need to do it. If you, if you really want to define that, you can define it just, the, just enough with the knife, either going this way or that way, depending on quite how it's tilted within the grain. So, um, and then in terms of length, I mean, this is probably seven, I'm gonna say seven and a half inches. Yeah, actually it's coming in at closer to eight, just under eight. Um, it can be nice depending on how you buy your ice cream to get one with a slightly, to make one with a slightly longer handle, an extra inch on the end there would allow you to get down into the bottom of the thing without getting ice cream all over your knuckles. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, this, this size is based off of the size that ice cream parlors have, but a slightly longer handle is good. I will say, just visually, I prefer the shorter handle. When I've made longer ones, I like how they function, but the the heaviness of the handle starts to overwhelm the size of the bowl. So it's a toss up between aesthetics and and functionality at that point. So any questions before I go into to making one? I had one that that slight curve on the top that you were talking about. I was thinking that 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 there was a functional aspect to that that it might help with your thumb, you know, as you're trying to push down. If it's minimal, then yeah. Yeah, it's really it's so minimal that it's not really. It's more just a. I mean, it does look nice. Like it, yeah. it's nice to have that yep. there. But, um, but what I've come to realize is like, don't try and create that with the axe. Create it with the the knife because it really you just need a little tiny bit, and that subtle of an amount, it's much easier to define with the knife. Gotcha. The yeah. Anybody um, else questions? Yeah. Feel free to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. If so, not, then we'll move on. All right, here I go. So um, all the standard caveats apply of you know choosing a nice bit of wood that doesn't have uh, anything that's going to trip you up. Um, particularly with these wide handles. Wide handles really do require, I mean, this is part of why I didn't used to make them was that the difference between, you know, a facet being whatever that is, half an inch versus being a quarter of an inch really is tremendous in terms of what you're asking the knife to do. So um, if the wood has any imperfections, it will, it will throw you for a loop there. So as always, I, I tend to start with an overlong billet. Um, probably so that I can leave some distance between my thumb and the ax, but also because it allows me to sort of look at the wood and decide where, where it's gonna fit. So there's a little knot here and I could either go up so that that was at the bottom of the ink and therefore got removed, or I could shove the whole thing down and just avoid it all together. And looking at the other issues in the wood, I might try and chop down through it because there's another little, wobble in the grain right there. And if that ends up being midway through the handle, it'll be more of a pain in the neck. So um, I like to do my crank first. And, you know, like I said, you don't want much crank, but at the same time, uh, you don't want the, part of the problem here is that the, 
I didn't depress the line of the from the tip of the bowl to the tip of the handle here. This was all one thing. Is that visible? Mm. Yeah, now that's one thing right there. And really, what I should have done is what I'll show you here, which is to depress the line of the, the lip of the bowl by essentially going further up. Hold on, my. Um, by going further up and scooping it down to that down below the line of that highest point of the back end of the handle by the time I get to where the tip of the bowl is. And that will help me have that kind of sort of dagger function of punching down into the ice cream. And then more so than most, usually when I come in at the back of the crank to chop this down, that's a sacrificial thing that's gonna be, all of this material is usually eliminated when I come down the handle. But in this case, it's gonna stick around and that's gonna be the back of the bowl. So I wanna be real careful not to hit that with the ax because I don't want mm. any cracks in that. You know, the, probably the, the, the most common catastrophic error that happens here is you're going through and you realize you tap the back of the bowl and this whole nice piece crumples away. Um, and usually I can salvage it because it's chunky enough that I can still get a, a good ice cream scoop out of it but that's that's one of the things to pay attention to and then just coming down here but again i don't want to make it meet in one v i want there to be that little zigzag bit that forms the back of the bowl i'm just trying to get under whatever issues this bit of wood has on the surface that's pretty good and then leave about that much, let me turn it around. Leave about that much, it's gonna be the back of the bowl. So then as I always do, I draw my shape by doing the bowl first. And I like to leave my bowls kind of wide at the tip at first, because you can always make them narrower. But if you make the bowl too pointy at first, then you're kind of stuck. And then I divide the bowl with a center line, extend that center line down the handle. And then I had to really train myself uh, of what, what size handle is really the correct width because when you start doing these wide handles, it just feels kind of wrong. You're all calibrated for regular spoon handles. But that's pretty much what I'm shooting for there. And, and let's, having freehand drawn that, you can see that more or less, this fits perfectly on it. So you, you, do, you do get that internal calibration over time of just this is how long it should be. And I think it has less to do with my eye than it does to do with the feel of the body mechanics of how long I've drawn the mark. So now I'm gonna trim it. And then we'll ax it here. Let me tilt it down so you guys can see better. Uh, I'm just curious. Every once in a while, um, you, your audio kind of, or the, the video image and the audio kind of breaks up and pauses for a moment. And I'm just wondering if that's on my end or if everybody else is seeing that. It might be on my end. We're, we're, at, the, we're at the part of the, we're the furthest extent of the Wi-Fi from my house. So I okay. apologize. It's not too I've, bad. I've got that too. So Okay. Not too bad. All right, so this is a nice trick if you don't do this, the sinking the ax in the edge of the stump so that it forms a pivot stop. Because when you pull with the saw and your hand is the pivot, this wants to spin. But if it's up against the beard of the ax there, then it mm. holds everything stable with minimal amount of effort on your part. Stop cuts, and again the stop cuts. I do. I put the saw into this cock position, and then I just take my hand and do palm forward like this, and that allows me to do a nice straight up and down cut on the near side to me, which is a lot easier than trying to do it with the off hand or some other way. Yeah. Now, quick, quick question. Are you leaving, or, like, is that handle that you drew, is that pretty much the finish line, or are you going to go a little bit inside of that eventually? 
I probably it'll I'll go inside of it, but it, um, certainly with the bowl I'll go inside of it. it. Yeah, I mean it's it's tough for me to say because I mean of course it has to go inside of it because if I ax to that line, then everything has to reduce from there. Right. Um, well, I, I mean, I guess what I'm trying to say is, are you trying to act as close as possible to your final shape, or are you leaving a little bit of wiggle room in case you need to shift anything because of the wood? So I concentrate much more on making the depth of the blank appropriately thin than I concentrate on getting close to the outline because okay, because the the depth is what really makes it hard to carve, and if you if you're away from the outline, but it's not too thick, it's really yeah. easy to go in there with a knife and adjust it. Um, but if, but if, um, but if it's really chunky still, because I haven't axed down the back sufficiently, then everything is a pain. So now I'm just splitting off the waste material from the handles. You got to remember when you split that the the run is going to go towards the side with less material. So with fat handles like this, that's pretty straightforward and easy but now before i go and ax closer to that handle outline i'm going to i'm going to depress the back of the bowl and the back of the handle so that I, i'm not trying to act across quite so much um all right so you can see i've got quite a steep curve there going yep. on I've gone fairly close to that tip now Okay, so with a chunky handle, I'll still have a fairly fat blank, but it's it's much, you know, it's probably half as thick as it was now. So now's the time to go back through and get off the waste material. So notice that I'm the axe isn't actually pointing down towards the down towards the neck at all with this technique. What I'm doing is I'm creating a shock wave that then pops the material free like this and you can actually see it better on the back i've created a shock wave that then creates these cracks that go down to that stop cut and that allows me close to this outline without risking putting cracks in the back shoulders which was always my nemesis start out carving and then this last little bit i'm just not going your, to your, not your going video lag a little bit clean um, what's that your video lagged there, so uh, just show what that last little bit was you were talking about again. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, yep, I'm gonna put it. So I'm gonna put this back higher up because I think maybe I was doing better with Wi-Fi from there. Um, so this last little bit, when you have something like that and you're tempted to use the ax to take it off, just don't. Um, that's always a hard <laughs> lesson for me to learn, but you know, that's when I end up putting the crack and splitting off the side of the bowl. So just don't do it. Um, okay, so now I've got, I'm sort of right at the sides of my bowl, right at the sides of the handle. I've got my correct thickness on the back, more or less. And now I'm gonna uh, reduce the back of the bowl. And so what I'm gonna do is come in at an angle like that. And what I'm looking for is to get the correct thickness right here on the widest part of the bowl. And then I'm gonna lean down on it and get much closer to the edge at the tip. You can see I actually come right down to a sharp point there. And what, that, what that's gonna happen is then when I go around the outline here, now you can see I have the appropriate thickness all the way. So you wanna lean down into that corner of material that's gonna be removed. Make sure you maintain that rim thickness with right the widest part, and then lean down into the corner. And then when you go around, the corner is going to be just right. So gotcha. now I've got my rim basically all the way around. I've got a sharp little point in the middle. And I'm always looking out for cracks. You know, when you're when you're axing, this is the moment to abandon ship if anything looks out of order. Um, and I know that this particular 
quarter of cherry. The last time I was carving yesterday, it, it threw me a couple curveballs in terms of cracks in it. So I'm really keeping a sharp eye on it because you want to catch them as soon as possible so that you can not waste your time. And okay, so now I'm just going to do the back shoulders and I'm going to again thin those before I go around the outline. So thin the shoulder just like that. And now I'm going to go around the outline. The outline for these wide handles, I don't actually need to do the thing where I support them on the, the neck on the edge of the stump and come down at an angle. Because they're so wide, it's I reach the handle line before I get to beyond the point that the axe can go around the curve. For yeah. a regular handle, that last little bit is where I'd have to support it and come down at more of a right angle perpendicular to the neck. But because these wide handles, the, the handle sticks out so close to the edge of the bowl that I just don't need to do that. So you can also see how gentle my axing has become here. Okay. Now, one last thing that I sometimes like to do with these is just knock off a bit of a chamfer with the ax because it's much easier to do than with the knife. But it depends. If I feel like the grain is at all squirrely and it's gonna split on me in some weird way, then I won't do that. I'm gonna do, but this grain is quite nice, so I am. I'm gonna do the same on the back. So I've already essentially created that heavily faceted, chunky handle outline. You can see here in the cross section, it's not perfect, yep. but it gets me sort of much closer to it. And I can, I can tell that I'm sort of at my correct fitness now. So right, let me reset the camera for carving purposes. All right, so let's compare the two now. So here's the finished one. Here's the big one. You can see that this one's got quite a bit of extra handle and extra um, bowl. So that answers your question right there of, you know, within that drawing, how much material is there to be removed? Yep. A fair bit, which is good because um, I still have yet to redraw the shape. And, and you'll notice that, you know, I focus more on having it be the, relatively thin. And then within here, I want enough slop that I can redraw the shape, cock it slightly, you know, five degrees one way or the other to get it realigned with the handle, that sort of thing without losing the ability to, to get the shape that I want. So I always prioritize um, a slightly larger blank. And I believe, um, Sunny could maybe confirm this, but I believe we, we, I don't know if you have a scale on that template, but we essentially set it up to be the size of the drawing that I sent him which is the size that I would draw it on a piece of wood, not the size of the finished thing here. So okay. bear in mind, you're looking at that template, you're not looking at a template of the finished size, you're looking at a template of the size that I draw the outline when I first draw it. Um, right, you left on the template, it's six and a half inches long. Interesting, so yeah, so I would make that, I would make that longer. I think this one is, but, but again, that's the sort of thing where, you know, yeah, I mean, it just, it, it really depends. I, maybe this was one of the ones with the slightly longer handles. It, it, you know, play with it. I don't think of this shape as being particularly, um, I never think of any of my shapes, first of all, as being mine, uh, nor do I think of them as being set in stone. And so, you know, I love what Rachel did. because I, I think it's the sort of the idea of the thick handle and the idea of the thick bowl that then tapers to a fine edge and the idea of the sort of high back to the bowl. Those are the things that really matter and all the other, you know, the actual dimensions can make a really big one and it'd be totally sweet. Um, You're killing the engineers among us. Get out your calipers, come on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now I'm gonna carve the outline. Um, and basically all I do when I carve the outline is I try to get underneath all the ax marks and saw marks and just make sure that there's no surprises. So, real quick. And I want to work fast. 
um, because what, I, what you find is that the wood will start to form a hard skin. And by moving fast, carving soft, fresh wood. And, um, and if I were to pause, I would bag up my work in a plastic bag. But you can see, you know, I'm, I'm basically just very crudely going around this outline, not trying to get anything perfect, just making sure there's no surprises, especially here at the neck. And it's just a process of quick refinement. Because again, those finished surfaces, when they're half the thickness that they are right now, they're gonna be half as difficult to get nicely cleaned up. I'm gonna run a fan real quick because it got humid all of a sudden. You tell me, I'm gonna put it on low and you tell me if it's too annoying a sound. Okay. Oh, that's much nicer. I can feel the breeze. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Let's see, I've done the handle, done around the bowl. I need to do the handle end. And I like to do curved handle ends largely because they're simple. It adds a nice little detail without being too fussy. And also very importantly, it knocks off these corners so that then when you're bracing the spoon against your chest, it doesn't dig into your sternum in quite the same way, which is really nice. Okay, so now we have sort of Round the outline, it's all clean enough, good enough. And now I'm gonna do the top face. And whether I start with the bowl or with the handle is really a matter of what I think might cause me more trouble. Um, in this case, I'm not really worried about either of them. So I'll just start with the bowl. And that's these two um, cuts, which are really kind of weird and unlike anything else. So I brace the spoon against my sternum. I put my thumb underneath the side here to support against the force of the knife, but underneath so that it doesn't get cut. And then I tuck my knuckles of my uh, these two fingers here against my um, ring and pinky finger here. And that's the pivot point. And then by mm -hmm. lowering my hand, I essentially make the knife do this. And so it's not coming from my wrist coming from raising and lowering my head. I actually get a little further away from my bench here so I can do that. Um, and so usually when, when you have a spoon that doesn't have this high back, you can go all the way around to the neck, but here you definitely can't because it starts to go uphill in the grain so strongly. So that's one side. And then the other side I do with a pivot cut that is essentially pivoting on this thumb on the spine of the blade here. And and with a short form like this, or especially with one that has like a, hey, get out of here, yellow jacket. Um, I almost stabbed my hand the other day by swatting at a yellow jacket. Right. <laughs> right into the knife. But I just got stung yesterday, so I'm gonna tell that guy to go away. Good. Um, so essentially, because the form is has such a thick neck, it's a little trickier than usual to pick, to hold it between your fingers like this. And so bracing against your leg is a nice way to just hold it a little more stable while you do that. Okay, so now I've got my top rim and you can see that it's more or less aligned with the top edge of the handle here. And then I'm gonna do the, the back rim here, which I'm just gonna do as a push cut and I'll start in the middle, but then I'll focus more on one side and then on the other side. Rather, if this was a narrower form, I'd probably just focus on sort of doing all of it at once. Um, when I do the sort of bump down in the necks of my spoons that form those little curved scallops, I'll do it as one thing. Um, but here, because the bump down is essentially the back of the bowl, it's too wide to do as one thing. And so you start in the middle and then, then concentrate on one side or then the other. And then, because I, it, it's hard to get it perfectly clean, I'm gonna come back to it just a little bit. And what I'm looking to create is to clean up just this narrow little strip between here and here. That's all I need, because that's where the rim is gonna go. Doesn't matter if there's a crack further in, 
It just needs to not have a crack in this little quarter inch that's right by the edge of the bowl here. Um, so that's what I'm looking to create. And the thing I like about this pivot cut, as opposed to doing it this way, which a lot of people do, is that especially in situations like this where you're trying to create a clean surface, it's much easier to do with a with a this pivot because you can see what you're doing. So you can see the line you're cutting and you can also see the surface you're creating and generally have more control over it. Um, so I am a big believer in that style of push cuts for things. You'll never see me do a, a chest lever cut or anything like that because I feel like I have so much more power and control by doing uh, essentially push cuts with my thumb or this sort of pivot cut where it's all right in front of me and using um, the power of my hands rather than my body mechanics. Um, I like that much better. Okay, so now I've got the rim and the bowl clean where I need them to. They've got the correct uh, silhouette from the side and they're basically aligned from one side to the other. Now I'm gonna do the top of the handle and I'm gonna start by defining um, just this top edge. And there's a bit of squirrely grain here, but I'm gonna feel it out. I think it's gonna be on the facet and not on the top here. A little bit on the top. Um, but okay, so I'm, I've got my, my top edge. That's the way I want it. And now I can pull down and redefine this facet on either side. One of the nice things about these fat handles is that if they behave themselves, the whole thing comes together quite quickly. So this is where you start to define that little thumb push up. It happens on either side because you're coming down like this on the, the side facet. But then in this case, partly because there's a little grain hiccup, but also partly because of how the handle interacts with the rim of the bowl, you have to come in from the bowl side and clean it up from that direction. And so it sort of naturally creates the circumstances where you're gonna create that little thumb scoop. Here I am just dealing with this a little bit of weirdness in the grain. It's okay, good. All right, so that's one side facet done. Now we'll do the other side facet. Okay, come down to about there. Now I come in from the other side. And when I come in, part of what I'm doing is I'm defining the line of this back shoulder of the bowl here. So you can see how it's too squared off here. And that's fine because when I come in with the knife and kind of knock off that corner, now I've got closer to the, the shape of that back bowl that I want. And I'm actually gonna see create the curvature of the back bowl by how you bring those mm -hmm. fast down to the handle. Um, but I don't want to do too much yet because I still have to redraw everything. So really, I'm just trying to get underneath things, make it all thinner, um, and everything will sort of come more into focus in a minute. So now I'm going to do the back of the spoon. And I always start here at the deepest part going towards the, the tip of the bowl. And for me, that's always a, a hand squeeze where you're pulling the, the spoon back against the knife. But in this case, it's a hand squeeze followed by a pivot because I'm trying to get a nice long extended cut. So I'm doing the hand squeeze and then either during the hand squeeze or coming off the end of the hand squeeze, depending on the circumstance and the direction I'm carving, I'll do a, a pivot as well. To make sure to, to leave a fair amount of beef back here. You don't want to make it too thin. Um, there's, there's no, this is one of those forms where there's no brownie points for making it particularly thin. So now I'm going to do the sides of the bowl, same deal. I'm going to start at the, that widest part, which is also where the grain change happens. And I'm going to define the, underside of the rim more or less doesn't have to be perfect the way I want and then I'm going to meld it into what's happening on the back because 
you do the other way, if you start up here in the middle and try and work your way down to the rim, chances are you might screw it up. Whereas if you start with the rim first and then blend the two, you're gonna end up with exactly what you need at the rim and it's gonna be blended. How am I doing? Anyone have any questions at this point? You're doing great. What, you. I have to say, one, one of the things that I've always been impressed with Emmett is his ability to articulate what he's doing as he's doing it. Um, and this is a perfect example of that. Uh, so yeah, you're doing great. If anybody has questions, feel free to unmute and, and ask away. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing, how just how difficult it is to, for you to describe what you're doing, but you're doing a great job. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, okay, so now I'm doing the back of the bowl. Now, I've noticed one problem area right here is there's a bit of really squirrely grain right here where there's a bunch of tear out. And so as I come down that facet, I'm gonna to need to stop at the squirrely grain and come in from the other direction. Um, and that's largely a function of when you have these fat handles, you're gonna have that kind of tear out more commonly because you're not angling the handle across the grain as strongly as you might because the handle is remaining fat. Right, mm -hmm. it's both fat in this dimension, but it's also thick in this dimension. So that amount of grain tear, if I was making, you know, as thin a handle as you'd have on an eating spoon, say, it just wouldn't exist. You'd be leaning across the grain so strongly that you wouldn't have that tear out. You'd be angling across even that wobbly grain. But because I'm more closely following the grain, um, it, it, it happens, um, which is one of the reasons why I, I don't like carving crooks, because when you carve crooks, you end up following the grain much of the time and you end up having to deal with that grain tear out. So now I'm going to same deal. I'm going to define the, the center line of the back of the handle. And that's just a simple pull cut. And then depending if I was doing a sort of a thinner form, I might finish it by bracing this hand, the knife hand against my body, and then pulling out like this. That's a nice way to finish those cuts. But because it's such a wide form, I'm actually going to come in here Remember I said, I love the hand squeeze cut. I'm just gonna finish it with a hand squeeze cut because it gives me a lot more control and there's a lot less likely to, um, you can often navigate grain tear out in this way more easily with a hand squeeze cut than with anything else. Now to do these back shoulders, I could do a pull cut to go around the back shoulder, but then I wouldn't be able to see the line that I'm creating here at the neck. And so I'm gonna start with a hand squeeze cut. Because again, I can see what I'm doing and I'm gonna create that back shoulder line to have the line that I want it to have, which in this case is, I actually want it to be a kind of a, here, I'll show you in just a second. I don't want it to be kind of like a, there's this beautiful curve that you can get where the underside of the rim comes down and then it forms the, the line on the bottom of the handle. Mm. I don't want it, I want it to, essentially flare out right at the part where it would normally kick up and go over to follow that upper rim. Um, so that's, you know, I'm trying to create an equal line on, on both sides. And so I'll do that on either side. Good. And now I'm going to do the pull cuts to get the handle cleaned up. And here I am doing that grace cut because what the heck? And then here is where that squirrely grain is. So I can feel when it changes. And now I'm gonna come in from the other side. Ah, but it's tricky. See, it's not, ah. All right, so this part wants to be cut that way. This part wants to be cut that way. And then this part wants to be cut that way. So it's a real mess. But this is where um, a couple things. First of all, a lower angle sloyd blade will be easier than a very aggressive shallow angle blade at handling this kind of grain change. So this knife that I have here is from uh, Jonathan Tamarkin, an Israeli knife maker who we featured in the magazine a little bit ago. And he sent it to me and, and it's, it's a, 28 degree blade, which is 
or maybe it's even a 30. He basically made it because he found that um, Israeli carvers tend to be carving harder, drier wood than mm. you know, here in the Northeast. And so they were having more blade damage. So he made a, essentially a stouter blade to make it so that they didn't have that blade damage. Um, and I said, it's too, it's too hard to push through things, but it does make it an excellent blade for navigating that changing grain in the same way that you'd have a high angle plane to navigate ripply grain. Um, it's the same same thing. The higher the angle, um, the the more gracefully it will sort of smooth over places where the grain changes. Um, so it's a good knife for this particular setup. I, I'm using this knife because I did a photo shoot yesterday for the magazine where I was trying to show the flash method, uh, my method of showing wh what still needs to be sharpened when you're sharpening. And I went to sharpen all my other sloids and found that none of them had enough secondary bevel to uh, to have a good flash. So I had to go back through my catalog and find old photos, but I essentially am halfway through sharpening all my other slides right now. <laughs> I was trying to find that, but I was trying to create that photo and then it just, none of my knives was dull enough to really create a, a good strong image of it. So I got it in the end, but i um, using this one right now. I will say um, I, I just ordered another one of these Sloyds from Jonathan and he has some knives for sale. Um, his knives are excellent. The handle shape is great. I think he's he's he took my advice, I think, and calmed this down just a little bit. Um, but it's beautiful size, weight, handle. He's got the edge geometry beautiful. He's got the the metallurgy down. Um, and the shape is my absolute preferred shape. Um, so really good source if you're looking for a Sloyd knife, um, good good source of them. Um, okay, so now, I'm just about saying now, now I'm gonna redraw the shape. I essentially have cleaned up all the surfaces. I've basically brought everything down to a point where it'll be easier to make nice clean surfaces at this point. And now I just need to realign everything. So I'd like to do that with pencil. And generally speaking with this form, usually I start by sort of defining where the neck is, but with this form, I start by redrawing the bowl shape because the neck is sort of meaningless because it's such a wide neck. It doesn't help you align the center line in the same way. It's too easy to be off by an eighth of an inch here or there. Mm. And so the best thing is to redraw the bowl shape. And you'll notice when I'm drawing that I keep my hand planted on my leg and I'm just moving arcs with the, the pen or the pencil rather. And that allows me to get a much more even curve. If I were to try and do an arc here and then do an arc on the other side, much harder to get a nice even shape. Um, it's much easier to make this curve match this curve because I did them with the same motion of my hand. So I spin the spoon and And I also find it helps if you squint at it. Let's add this a little bit more. And here's the point where I, I will start to fuss a little bit over do, how pointy do I want the, the handle end. Um, part of that's aesthetics. Part of that is, you know, the pointier you make it, the more easily it'll punch through the ice cream. Um, and then I will take that bowl shape, kind of look at what needs to happen to the handle to get it to line up. In this case, I'm gonna shift the handle angle by a degree or two. Good, so now I have my redrawn shape. And at this point, it's a rinse and repeat. I'm gonna carve around the outline. I'm gonna carve the top face, carve the bottom face, and then I'll carve the bowl. And- Any, I yeah, find that when I'm trying to re-carve the outline on the bowl, I tend to get like little dips and like I, I can never get it into a smooth, what I what feels like a smooth curve. Yeah. Any right. tips every, there? Because every time the knife starts and stops, it's a just slightly different facet. Yeah, right. so the biggest the biggest help is just getting it refined enough that you can make a longer cut. 
so that instead of making lots of small cut, like, like I don't like this potato peeler cut because people tend to use it and do these small cuts, right? Right. Whereas with a with a hand squeeze cut, even though I can't see it, I can use my intuition from looking at it and then anticipating to create these much longer cuts. In general, with a hand squeeze cut, you can get a longer cut than you can with any other style of cut, which is why I like it. And so that combined with having made it sufficiently thin, thin yeah. in this dimension is the best advice I can give you. I'm sorry, I don't have a, a better nope, answer. Than that's okay. I, I, the other thing I was gonna say, when you completed going through and doing all the, the, the previous run of night work, knife work before doing this, you're also one of the most intentional carvers in terms of knowing and again, being able to articulate what cut you're using and why in any given situation. I yeah. find, like, I don't think it through. I'm just kind of tending to go with whatever feels good right. when I'm doing something at the moment. And when I hear you articulating why you're doing it this way instead of another way, it's like, oh, okay, wow. <laughs> There's logic here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, you know, it's, there are lots of ways of carving. And I think I've, I've, I sort of taught myself the way that I do it because I was, I essentially, any time that I was, I would follow other people's ways of carving. And anytime I struggled, I would ask myself the question of why am I struggling? And then what, you know, like, okay, I'm struggling because of this. And then what, what is making that be the case and what could I do differently? And so my system has developed off of asking the question of, you know, what's, what's tripping me up here. And so that it has been a very deliberate process. And then certainly all the, when I was teaching, you know, there's nothing quite like trying to articulate to someone why you should do it this way instead of that way that yeah. um, gives me opinions. And I, you know, I also think that you can carve any way you want to carve and that's the beauty of it. And um yeah you know I, I've, I've met very few people who do things exactly like me and that's probably as it should be so now i have uh come down the handle and i'm cleaning up the neck and essentially what i did is i came down the handle left it attached like that and now i'm coming around the shoulder here with just the tip of the knife and the goal is to ease my way under it now the neck is always a problem area. And it's particularly so on this wide form because it is about twice as wide a surface that I'm cleaning up as I normally would be. So mm -hmm. it's relatively unforgiving in that respect. Um, so you wanna make sure that your knife is as sharp as you can make it. You wanna make sure that, um, that you're easing your way under and not trying to sort of get it perfect with the first, the first cut and um, and also, if you're if you're carving super green wood, you do want to let it dry out a little bit between those roughing out cuts, redraw the shape, and then let it dry out before you do this. Because I'm carving wood that has been aged in the log, what moisture there is in it tends to leave much more quickly um, at that point. So it can still be almost a similar moisture content as a freshly felled thing, and yet the moisture will, for whatever reason, I don't understand it, it leaves more quickly when hmm. it's been aged. Log. So this is cherry that's been sitting around for a year in a log, and it, it's it's getting close to dry at this point. Um, so now I'm going to come down this handle. This one has sort of squirrelier grain, so I'm going to be real careful. So part of this, these sorts of cuts are very hunched over, and they're, they're they use your pectoral muscles a lot. And I've come to realize that these sort of power pull cuts. I used to think they use my back muscles more, but they really don't. It's more of like, it's all this in the pecs. And it's easy for your pecs to get overly tight and be sort of chronically overly tight. And that was causing me to have numb hands for years. And the thing that I have found that has helped the most, aside from just taking time off carving, which because I do it professionally, I can't really. The thing that has helped me the most with that has been carrying a weighted rucksack because that works the muscles between my shoulder blades and mm -hmm. when those muscles are stronger it naturally pulls it back which naturally opens up my chest without trying to make my chest stronger 
which only exacerbates the problem. I actually need to make the oppositional muscles stronger. So I have a 45 pound plate that I carry in a special rucksack that's designed for that. And I wear it whenever I walk the dogs twice a day. And that has made my numb hands stop being numb because my, my chest, even though it still gets all that use is being opened up all the time by stronger back muscles. So that's one thing to consider if this is a problem for you. And I, I'm worth saying, I, bet I worked my way up to 45 pounds. I started with a 20 pound plate and then went to 30 and then 35 and then I went to 45. And I don't think it's worth going past 45 because the military has done a bunch of studies and found that basically past 45, 50 pounds, you start having more injuries and fewer uh, benefits. Um, so it's not a, it's not a, I'm not, not trying to increase it anymore, but it's been tremendously helpful. And when I don't do it, I can really, I can really tell my, my hand health starts to deteriorate. Okay. So at this point, it can be hard to assess sort of whether it's all lined up at this point, largely because this part of the handle where the handle doesn't quite match up with the the line I've drawn of the bull, it just kind of masks the whole thing and makes it tricky to tell what the heck is going on. Um, so you do your best at this stage and then you can do a little more refining once you've gotten the handle sorted out. Just gonna re-carve the curb with the handle end. And notice here that I am deliberately doing sort of a series of facets. Um, I quite like the tactility of these facets that go across the handle end. Um, and when I do the facet along the side, it's it's nice to have the sort of chunk, 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 chunk around the handle end. Um, just gives an extra, I don't know, an extra feeling of a little more chaos to something that is otherwise quite controlled. Okay, so now I've got my outline redone. I'm gonna do the exact same uh, pivot cuts to do the bowl. Um, but this time I'm paying particular attention to making that line nice and sweet. And I also remember you want to be able to punch down through the ice cream. So I don't want to swoop the rim too deeply here. I want to keep the rim fairly straight across and then swoop up rather than create a rim that swoops low. Mm -hmm. So even though I have the rim thickness to do that, because I don't need to in terms of aligning the rim with the handle, I'm not gonna do that very much. And then the other side. And this one does need to go a little bit lower, I can tell, just to get it so that it's more nicely aligned with the um, with the handle. So now there's that top rim done. And now before I redo this, I'm gonna I'm gonna define this back shoulder of the where the bowl meets the handle here. Because if I go and make these rim cuts on the inside now, I'm gonna mm. remove that line that I drew. So I want to essentially come in here with pull cuts, a series of delicate ones that will very carefully without causing more brain trouble. And it's okay that the if they're going backwards in the grain, it's kind of messed it up a little bit, but you can see how I've now defined that bottom edge of the bowl there. And now I can come in here and rather than try and go straight across the whole thing, now I'm really just gonna go around the outside here. And what I'm trying to create is that line of the bowl. Right there, you can see on one side is nicely created on one side. And it's always easier to do it on one side than on the other side, so that was the easy side. Now with this side, I've got to kind of do kind of a slidey motion where I'm gonna slide my the knife along my thumb, along the spine of the thumb here. And that's gonna allow me to cut sort of sideways and then down. get that other side ease under that line there it's not as exaggerated a slide as what i showed you without doing it but that's essentially what i'm doing is 
cutting and sliding like that as I do a little twist. And that allows me to get this side. You'll see when you're doing one, one side is trickier than the other. And then I'm gonna come in here with, again, hand squeeze cuts are much better at cleaning up squirrely grain than bowl cuts. And now I'm just trying to make both sides of the bowl have sort of equal curvature. And this is the fussy part. I will say I found that, um, I'm not sure what this one has. It is, it works quite well to allow this back part of the bowl to really taper quite strongly. Um, so it doesn't need to be a broad curve here. If it's a quite a narrow curve, that will work almost better in terms of scooping the ice cream, so long as it has a pronounced curvature this way. That's the part that matters. It doesn't matter how wide or narrow it mm. is here in the back. Um, and so to some extent, I let, I'm just sort of trying to figure out how far do I want to fuss and at what point does the chance of screwing it up outweigh the opportunity to make it better and try and stop before I pass that threshold. Okay, good. Now I'm gonna clean up these facets one last time. And I'm gonna concentrate on what does the line look like on the side here. So rather than worry about the whole face of the facet, I'm just gonna worry about the line that it makes. Make that line really nice because our eye sees the line, our eye sees the edge. It doesn't see what the, the whole face looks like. If the edge of the face is really nice and clean, then the surface can have a bunch of wobbles and multiple faces to it. And your eye will just see it as like, wow, that's one clean facet. Um, because we see, that's what we see. Now, because I have this squirrely grain here, I'm going to see if I can maintain some of the strong fastening at the end. But then as I get towards the handle here, I'm gonna change it into a much more of a sort of softened curve, multiple facets sort of thing, because that's gonna allow me to navigate these weird grain changes here. This is where I said that, you know, you want the most perfect piece of wood that you can get. All right. And the hand squeeze cut, it's helping me navigate that swirly grain really nicely. And I might be able to pull off more facets here than I thought. Now, Here's my opportunity to create that little bit of a thumb dimple here. And again, like I said, some you got to kind of feel out which direction it's going to be willing to cut. And depending on how it's lying across the grain, it'll you might need to go more from one direction than from the other direction for different pieces of wood. But this one, it definitely wants to come in more from the handle side and then is willing to sort of swoop out as I get close to that rim. Close. And Does anybody have any questions for Emmett? You do, feel free to unmute and ask away. All right, so now before I move on, I'm just going to pull a micro chamfer down each of these handle sides here. And that's just a way of softening that edge, just a smidge. I'm not trying to eliminate the chamfer. I wanna be able to see it, but 
that micro chamfer just makes it more comfortable in the hand. There we go. It's funny, when I first saw this template, I expected that the handle was gonna be more, was gonna be even fatter than it actually is. It's actually wider and flatter than I thought it would be. Yeah, and I've, I've, I've messed with that. That's one of the ways it's evolved over time. It definitely started out as more like- uh, Octagonal or, yeah. Octagonal, yeah, exactly. And then what I realized was that really, it's much easier if it's not octagonal because that kind of radial symmetry is very difficult to achieve and it's very frustrating. And I could get the same effect by having a wide neck and then this could vary based on, you know, however fat it wanted to be but it actually yep. feels better in the hand and resists slipping just as well or perhaps even more. So that's definitely one of the ways that the, the design has evolved over carving a lot of them. And you know, now I look back at the, the ice cream scoops I was carving two years ago and I think, wow, that's really different. Um, but it's good that things evolve that way. Yeah. All right. So now I've always struggled with that even with like cooking spoons or, or, or even eating spoons, sometimes, there's like a trade-off between what feels good in the hand and what looks good visually. Totally. Like visually, it tends to be better if it's thinner, you know, in appearance. And yet in my hand, it always feels better when it's fatter. And I've not yet like found what I consider to be the sweet spot. Yeah, and certain, you know, it's it's unfortunate, but uh, especially if you're if you if you're trying to sell stuff. Um, it needs to be, it needs to photograph well. And so certain things photograph better than other things. Certain details just look better. And this is one of those forms actually that never looks particularly great when you just take a photograph of it like that. You're like, eh, whatever. But then it's it's when you can see that it has this bit that yep. sticks up the side. It's so nice. This is why I almost always photograph it at an angle like that so that you can yeah. see it. You know, it's one of those more dynamic forms in three dimensions. Whereas other forms, they work really well like this, but they're less impressive, you know, from the side. Yeah. So with any form, there's sort of a way of, there's a compromise that you make of like where where you want the functionality and where you want it to pop in terms of visuals. And um, yeah, I was dealing with that in, in this month's form. Here, let me grab this real quick for the Squid Monk Club form. I'm doing these, um, So for anybody who doesn't know, Emmett, why don't you just talk a little bit about your Spoon of the Month Club? Sure. So Spoon of the Month Club is a group of people who sign up to get a, a different spoon from me each month, um, and they get a recipe with it. And so I make a cohort of spoons each month, and it's $35 plus shipping. You can bow out at any time, and it's just a nice way for me to... It's a nice way for people to sign up and get spoons from me immediately instead of having to wait the three to six months that depending on the time of year that my wait list is. And then also uh, it's a great chance for me to get to practice a form over and over and over again. So, you know, do it 50 times. I get that much further along in my understanding of the form. And so, you know, this is a form where uh, I knew I wanted a rice paddle I tried doing these grooves that ran with the grain and I found that visually they just they just blend in like it's beautiful in the hand and you actually notice the grooves in person but in a photograph it doesn't look yep. like anything so I started doing these much more heavily textured honeycomb well first I started doing grooves that went diagonally across and that worked okay but then I started doing these honeycombs and that really pops and yeah. really like that and then visually when you're using it it's a nice tactile thing so um, you know, I was afraid to do this because there's a, I'm a very, um, I'm not a perfectionist, but my spoons are very tight and, and I was worried about the looseness of this. And, and so I've, it's been a real process of learning for me of like, how loose do I want it to be? Often my favorite parts of any spoon are the loosest parts, but for me, it has to come from a place also of proficiency. Otherwise it feels like the looseness doesn't have any quality to it. Um, well, you're but, also, I mean, from a practical business perspective, I mean, you're a production carver and you can't get overly fussy with trying to make it every facet exactly perfect. <laughs> yes, 
Yeah, and 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 yet and yet I want to be able to make something that is like I want to be proficient enough to be able to consistently make something the thing that they asked for. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but here's you know it's a great example that these honeycombs they just stand out in a photograph so much better. So um, often when I'm designing a form and it evolves over time, part of what happens is I. I figure out, you know, if, oh, if I do it this way, it just looks really nice. Yeah. Um, so that's, you know, it's worth worth considering. So now I'm gonna pull up the rim on the underside and I'm gonna get it nice and narrow, particularly at the tip. Um, not quite as thin as a an eating spoon would be, but maybe, um, maybe half again. It's not quite double what an eating spoon would be, but half again thicker than what an eating spoon would be for me. And um, again, I want to define that rim now because then I can blend the back of the bowl to meet it. And it's really the thing that matters the most um, in terms of functionality. So you can see it's fairly thin. Um, and so now I'm gonna go over the back of the bowl and just blend, blend, blend so that I have the deepest part in the center and then it really curves down to the rim on all three sides. And then I'll deal with the curvature at the back shoulders and the neck slightly differently. But this shouldn't take particularly long. There are some forms that I carve where I do the back of the bowl very last forms that need to go into someone's mouth, I will do the back of the bowl the very last because that allows me to get the inside of the bowl perfect and then like exactly how I want it to feel and then the outside of the bowl reacts to it. Um, and so I leave the outside fairly chunky until I get the inside perfect so that I don't end up um, going too, too deep and making the bowl too weak. But with this, because the inside of the bowl isn't gonna match the outside particularly. There's gonna be a lot of meat there. I can go ahead and finish the outside of the bowl here this early in the process and not have to come back to it. So at this stage of the game, I'm, I'm creating finished surfaces at every point that I can. So the, you know that handle, um, that top of the handle is now done. I won't revisit that. And once I get the back of the handle, it'll be done. This back of the bowl is done. And I'm essentially just checking things off the list, getting them done, and then not revisiting them so that I don't waste time faffing back and forth trying to get something perfect that I got good enough at an earlier so point. Is, is this sort of your normal process where you do the the bowl is pretty late? It looks like you're you're uh, almost yes. finished on all the rest of the handle. Is the bowl usually yep. the last thing you do? It is, it is usually the, the very last thing I do. And that's because <clears throat> um, if I come across some surprise, which these days I rarely do because I'm, I'm making fewer physical mistakes and I'm also better at spotting cracks earlier on. But it was fairly common when I started carving that I'd get you know all the way to the bowl only to realize that there was a crack at the neck. Um, or that you know I'd screwed up in some way, and and if I had waited to carve the spoon bowl, there was almost always some way that I could salvage the situation by shifting the neck down further into the shoulders, making the spoon bowl smaller, that sort of thing. But if I had hollowed out the spoon bowl at all, it drastically reduced my options to the point where I could where I often just had to throw away the thing. And so by doing waiting and doing the spoon bowl last, it just sort of keeps those possible avenues open as long as possible. Um, and also I found that psychologically it helped me to have a finished point at which I said, okay, moving on to the bowl now, everything else is done, don't revisit it. And that keeps me from mentally wondering to myself, I wonder if I should just do a little more here or a little more there. Um, I find it helpful to have that sort of stern break where I'm, I'm done. Um, so here is one cut that I, I do use in situations like this on the back of the handle where you brace and then pull up. Um, and depending on the knife geometry, if your knife chatters when, when you try to do that, I have a, a new knife from Roy Rocky um, 
that is chattering. And I'm pretty sure it's because he put a hollow grind on it and it's so freshly sharp that because that rail, when you're doing this, that rail is, even though in theory, how to describe this? When you're making this cut, you're always essentially describing a parabola through through space like this. Even if you think you're just going straight, you're not going straight. It's always some sort of slight uh, concavity that you're describing with the knife. And with a knife that is fresh from a, a knife smith who does a hollow grind and then true flats on it, it's chattering because in order for that edge to come up through the wood, there's no there's no difference in angle between the edge and the back of the blade. And so the back of the blade is, is bumping the edge out of the cut as you're trying to make that slight concavity. As you go to sharpen it over time, even if you do your very best job to maintain those rails perfectly flat, and you know I'm a big fan of a hollow grind and perfectly flat rails and all that, but you are gonna introduce some very slight convexity to the edge and that's actually a good thing because it allows you to make those smooth cuts that allows the knife to do essentially a flat but not perfectly flat because we're not machines um and have it not chatter um so if you have a knife that's chattering it's probably because you haven't sharpened it yet from the the bladesmith and that perfect geometry is not your friend um you want a slight bit of concavity and you'll get that as soon as you sharpen it because you're a human So now I'm doing the back of the handle. Oh yeah, here's that grain change that I found the first time. So now I'm mostly just trying to clean up the surface. Good. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm going to do my micro chamfer down the handles. Good. Okay, now I'm just going to go around the handle end, and all I'm going to do is just a, a chamfer that goes this way, but I'm not going to go up, 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 up. I'm going to go across, and that's going to give me a much smoother chamfer on the edge of the handle here. And if I do a sufficiently narrow chamfer, then I won't need to do anything else. If I do a too deep a one, then I'll feel like I have to then knock its corners off. But if I do a nice little narrow one, then it will be soft enough that I don't feel like I need to do anything else. And you saw how fast that was to get a nice, and it, it forms these sort of beautiful scallops as it goes over each of the, uh, each of the, the facets. Okay, so now everything is done except the bowl. Ah, don't go back to the handle. Be done. <laughs> um, so now I'm going to do the the bowl, and I am going to use the sloyd again to refine the rim, but um, but very quickly here. Oh, one last thing I'm going to do before I'm done is I'm just going to break a tiniest little micro chamfer that I can on the back of this underside of the rim here in the back of the bowl. So again, I don't have to think about it, go back to it, it's already done. In particular, I'm gonna make sure that I have it right at the tip. You want that little micro chamfer because that's what's gonna make the tip more durable. If you, if you don't 
chamfer it, then it, it does become a spot where the, the wood is stressed more. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna go in with a hook. And for this form, I do want my more curved hook. So this is the Monadnock from Matt. It's more of a continuous, uh, it's a tighter continuous curve. He does a, he has a mellow that I use for my larger cooking forms. And um, you want that tighter curve in order to get this back shoulder here. Um, the mellow is gonna be a little too wide. I could probably do it, but it'd be frustrating. So I'm gonna do what I usually do, which is choke way up on the knife so that my, my forefinger is right on that knife spine there. That means that when I open and close it, I can't actually hit my thumb. Whereas if I'm up like this, I'm that much closer and I will probably hit my thumb. So by dropping it down, I shift it away from my hand a little bit. It also gives me a lot more power. So then I brace my thumb on the far side, pull towards my thumb, go straight across the grain for these opening cuts. Straight across, straight across, and I'm working my way down the bowl to the tip, but I'm going straight across because otherwise I'd be going uphill in the grain and that's not a good place to be. And then I'm gonna go rah, up into that grain at the back of the bowl there. And that's a frustrating part for, for this part of things. So, okay, that, that's my opening gambit. Now I'm gonna come with the line of the spoon bowl here to get this part right here. So, across. And with the spoon bowl, I'm going to leave a fairly nice fat rim at the tip there. Okay, and now I'm going to plant it against my sternum. And I'm going to come in here, thumb braced on this back shoulder. Again, there's not much to grab here because of this wide handle. So it's helpful to lock it in with your other thumb. Um, but you don't want to lock it in too tight because your hand does need to be fairly dynamic here. It's not the same as on a when you're doing a cross thumb thing and you're just rah, rah, going for it. You do need to have a certain, I'm, I'm doing a certain amount of pulling back with my hand at the same time, just a little bit to give me the fluidity to follow that curve of the inside rim. And then because of the grain change, it's going to want to stay attached here at the back. So I'll leave that in this direction. And now I'll come across straight in with the curvature of the, the hook knife here. And remove those pieces. And use the curvature of the hook knife to essentially define that inside edge of the rim. And now I'll, I'll go across this back shoulder over here. A little more in the center just to even out the curve a little bit. Okay, so now, now I've roughed out that spoon, the, the bowl here, and now I'm going to flatten the rim with the Sloyd knife. So I like to flatten the rim because right now the rim might be hard to see. The rim is, when you look sideways at it, you see two lines. You see that the outer edge of the rim that I defined, but you also see that inner line as well. And it just doesn't look as sharp as if you were to flatten it. So again, I go back to these rim pivot cuts and the trick here is to try and flatten the rim without having the back edge of the blade touch any of this stuff back here. Um, going around, flattening. And now when I look at it from the side, it looks nice and crisp because all I'm seeing is the line created by that outermost edge. I'll do the same here. Good. Now the trickiest thing here is what do you do about these back, the rim at the back shoulders here? Um, like what is flat? What does flat even mean under those circumstances? And essentially what I'm trying to do is flat in this circumstance means 
what does it mean? It means if you were to, to if this was made out of clay, we're just watching the uh, Great Pottery Throwdown uh, as a family. Great show. <laughs> and one of the tools they use is that the, the wire to cut the pot off of the wheel when they're done. If you were to take a wire like that and, and pretend this was fixed in space, you had your wire on either side of it and go down with a wire to create that line as though you were a potter and this was clay, what would that line be? And that's how I determine, you know, what is the angle here that I'm trying to cut this back shoulder at? Trying to think in my head, okay, what, what would that wire be describing? And when you do that, you know, the tricky thing is that the, the other shoulder does get in your way on this, on one of the sides, on, on mm. one of the sides, doesn't but on one of the sides the the far side where you're working on one side and the knife goes across the other side you have to be really careful not to hit the speed that far side but you more or less get it and now That's before before i finish doing the inside of the rim i like to do the micro chamfer on the outside edge and the trick with the micro chamfer on the outside edge here is because going in this direction, it's actually going uphill in the grain. You have to make sure your knife is tilted so that instead of going uphill in the grain from the, the bottom of the crank to the tip of the spoon, you're actually going from the widest point around to the narrowest point. So it's going downhill in the grain when the knife is tilted like this, it's going uphill in the grain if the knife is like this. So you want your knife to be somewhat perpendicular to this top plane of the spoon so you got to be working it from the side it's very easy though to be working it a little too shallow and then mm. you'll put a crack in the spoon so you got to make sure you're working it straight from the side there and just the, the tiniest little chamfer i think of it more as like a scrape than a than a cut just scraping the wood Potter's wheel wire analogy is a great analogy. Thank you. Yeah, it just occurred to me because it's, yeah, I really love that show. It's Someday. a fantastic show. If you haven't watched it, folks, check it out. It's really good. I think that would be a really fun show. Get a bunch of spoon carvers together and give them challenges. I've often, I've been thinking that for a couple of years now with all these different, you know, types of, you know, comp, craft competition type shows. There's another one called Blown Away about glass blowers, which is really good. Right. Um, yeah, but but that one in particular is very good. The hosts are just really, really good on that show. And I like, you know, I like the heart that they have. You know, there's one, yep. of, the, one of the judges like tears up when, it, you know, and people do particularly well or surprise him with how yep. well they beer and it's just i love that and it's so there's just a great spirit amongst the competitors too because even though they're competitors they're they're more than willing to go out of their way to help each other out it's it's great yep, yep. yeah i like that and it reminds me of the spoon carving community totally um, okay so now everything is done the handle's done the except for the bowl i even got the micro chamfer on the outside so now i'm just going to do the finished surface on the inside of the bowl and then i'm done carving so i want to define that inner rim and i want there to be a fatter tip and then thinnest at the side so it's a little hard to see here um and it's not a great example it is fatter it's essentially this it's fatter at the tip twice as fat and then it tapers to being half as thick here half as thick all the way around um and basically that's easier to do than trying to achieve an even rim all the way around um is to let the rim taper because then you just need to make a sweet taper um and and having that fatter tip will just help protect it from wear and tear more it'll just be more material there so um, by fatter by fatter are you talking about the width of the rim yeah so when you look at it like this i mean okay. this, this thickness here and then it goes down to thinner over gotcha. on the side um and so again i'm similarly i'm establishing that line of the outer edge the way i want it and then i'll blend to it and that's a such a valuable technique to create the line you want where it matters and then blend to it rather than trying to create it as part of some other process 
And then I do the rim on the here. Again, you can see how I'm using the actual curvature of the, the hook knife here to create the line of the inner rim. It's sort of like it's partly creating a line and then partly the motion is creating a line. So it's a combination of the two. And then on this side, it's just the motion that's creating it, not the curvature. And that just has to do with the way the grain flow interacts with the mechanics of where your hands can be or not be. Okay, so now I've got my rim pretty much defined. Get this last little bit over here. And now I just need to, there's like a longer grain change transition on this form than on the way I typically do my, my other spoons because of having this big kick up at the back, which means that you just need to be real careful on these back shoulders here to not have grain tear out that's gonna get you too close to the edge. You gotta feel out where it changes and make sure you're going the right direction. And I like to try and clean up the back shoulders first. Have a bit where it's um starts to tear out down here at the bottom part. And then I'll come in from the other direction and clean it up from that other direction just because it's a it's a more controlled cut coming from the other direction. I'm trying to make sure I have a nice curvature on the inside here. This is where having that slightly tighter hook is helpful. It lets me punch a, a tighter curve into that back shoulder here. And I'm feeling it with my thumb to see where it needs more taken off. Okay, good. So now I've got the back shoulders all done. You can see the spot where there's a little bit of grain tear out just above my finger there. And I've got the rim defined. So now it's about blending down and trying to hit that just so. And not go deeper than that because this is this doesn't have quite as much meat on the back as it might otherwise have just the way it turned out. So I don't wanna go deeper than this or I'll make it um, now, is that because you think that maybe you went a little bit too thin when you were doing the back side? Um, it's always a relationship. So it's only too thin if I if I if I go too deep on the inside. Gotcha. Okay. Um, um, but but yes, certainly I could have arched the back more, um, and I didn't. So I just need to be aware of that and not yep. face a perfect thing on the inside without being aware of what my limitation is on the outside. Gotcha. I'm gonna kind of hog out the material here until I get down to it and then coast up to it. And now I can blend. 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 Okay, good. And there's one little spot that needs to be cut from the other direction. And when I get to this point in a spoon, 
you don't want to do this early on, but you get a cleaner finish with the hook knife if you go from the bottom up to the edge just for these final couple cuts. I don't understand why, but if you go from the edge down into the bottom, which is what you do most of the time, it doesn't create as clean a surface in that spot as if you go from the bottom up to the edge, but you have to be able to ghost out of it and not create too deep a mm. trench. So there's a certain amount of going back and forth, trying to get, and on this side, tiniest little bit, trying to get it so that there, there aren't those little spots where it looks like it's gone in the wrong direction. Um, How much pressure are you applying down onto the wood with the back of the blade when you're doing those? Almost, almost none. Okay. Um, yeah, it's really sort of a scrapey cut at this point. Um, yeah, and one more little. Yeah, at this at this stage, I'm doing very delicate scrapey cuts. And there we have it. So now I just need to burnish and polish and treat it and then I'm done. So uh, I just made this antler burnisher as part of the, uh, as a project for this month's, uh, this fall issue of the magazine that's coming up. Um, so you can use a, a smooth rock. I used a, a porcelain pestle for a long time. I used a piece of antler. Um, if you're using antler, I'll just give you the rundown real quick. You, you can cut it with any saw, um, and then you want to use an old crappy knife to, to sort of remove the corners. And then also in this case, it was an old dried out antler. And so I, I carved off the outermost surface to get down to smooth antler again. And then I sanded it starting with 400 grit and then going through 5,000 grit. Um, and then I essentially buffed it with my belt, my leather belt, just because I needed a piece of leather and I was somewhere that I couldn't get to any other piece. But you want to, essentially, you're creating a surface that hopefully will be smoother than your straw um, and smoother than, yeah, essentially than a straw. Because if your knife is stropped, it's going to leave a surface that's that smooth. You don't want to polish with something that's rougher than that. Um, mm. and, uh, and if you do use a bit of, porcelain it's helpful if it's unglazed um uh i have a i started using a pestle like a, a mortar and pestle where the bottom part was unglazed and then the handle was glazed and the, the glazed part doesn't really work very well um something about being unglazed but at any rate you just want to go around so i do like the way porcelain feels more than the antler for some reason. I mean, the antler works nice and it's it's nice that it you can't break it as easily, but I do prefer the feel of the porcelain. And when you burnish, it's kind of a choose your own ad adventure. You could burnish for several minutes and you would make a very rounded, compressed, smooth spoon, but I like the facets and I just want to knock them back just a little bit. And so I do a very, brief burnish. If there's a spot that feels a little rough, I might lean on it a little harder. Um, but you're never going to make uh, something that should have been dealt with with the knife. You're never going to be able to deal with it with the burnisher. It's not sandpaper. It's not going to make it go away. All it will do is kind of meld it into its surroundings a little bit more. Um, yeah, and over time, as it gets wet, those will expand and raise grain and all that anyway so yeah exactly and so um the part where i actually think it really is nice is on the handle ends i use a fair amount of pressure yep and what i can create is a really softened rounded chamfer on the end of the handle that looks and feels delightful especially when juxtaposed with those facets that are there so yeah. and then Sometimes I use the polisher, sometimes I don't. I tend to use the polisher mainly for larger forms. Um, but again, it's just polishing up the surface. And then I use the, 
a wax that I make that's two parts yojoba oil, one part beeswax. And for a spoon this size, I use about that much. The dirty little secret is that wood doesn't really need protection. It'll do just fine on its own. You might want it to be protected though from smudges or oxidation, or in the case of things like this that have a fairly thick piece of wood, I think it actually forms a crucial thing to finish them right away and not let them dry out because um, it prevents them from cracking by slowing down the drying process. Mm. The moisture is still in this handle, it's going to take a lot longer to come out through this surface layer of wax oil treatment. Um, and I have, I was wondering sort of when I started making these thicker handles, are they going to crack? Because cracking happens when there's a differential rate between a thin wall and a thicker portion and they're shrinking at different rates. And so uh, I was worried that would happen when I started doing these forms. I've never had one crack on me. I even did like a mortar and pestle, which I thought for sure the the mortar, the wooden mortar was going to crack. But I really think it's the partly it's using the seasoned wood that is naturally has a slightly lower moisture content, although this is pretty juicy still. But I really think the big thing is just the treating it right away. And then it has that layer of oil wax and it slows down the drying process. Sometimes, depending on how much moisture is in the wood, um, there can be a bloom within the spoon where it's like, um, there'll be an area that sort of has this like blush of color almost, often it goes sort of pink, like sort of white on the edges and then sort of a pinkish center. And that's chemical changes happening within the wood that's still being held within the oil wax mixture. And then it, as it slowly, because moisture can still get out through this, it just slows it down. As it slowly dries out, that resolves. And it, I mean, it's, it's not a bad thing. It's just, it's a reminder that, that the wood we're using is still a dynamic thing and, and is gonna undergo changes. So, um, and the nice thing I like about it is now it's ready to be used. And I've, you can retreat spoons that are like that. Oh yeah, look, it ended up bigger anyways. I didn't, I didn't take a, take a lot of time to pull it down further. Um, you can, retreat old spoons but i find that often they just they build up a patina that is from the foods that they're being used in um and i've also run most of my spoons through the dishwasher and i've found that actually the dishwasher i think something about the hot steam it pulls some of the oils from deeper in the wood out towards the surface and they actually have a nicer patina coming out of the dishwasher than huh. they beforehand so um i've run really delicate things through um yeah heresy heresy oh I know, I know. I, well, I want, <laughs> I, you know i've run things through multiple multiple times i have a couple spoons i've run through dozens of times at this point and i still wash most of them by hand just because but um but i i don't know i tell people not to worry about it so that's the that's the ice cream scoop um yeah it's a it's a fun it's a fun form it's a good reminder that um a lot of the things that we have can be made out of wood. They just, uh, you know, you need to figure out like what are the details that matter. Yeah. So awesome. I just I found that the cheapest rags uh, actually were um, if you buy the same sort of T-shirt that I wear, but if you buy them in like extra 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 large, you get a <laughs> lot more rag for the same amount of money. Um, and it's really it's like basically as cheap as buying a box of rags, but you get like a nice white, clean cotton rag that lasts for many months. Um, nice. So. All right, so anybody have any questions for Emmett? Now's your time. Don't forget to unmute yourself if you wanna ask something. Yeah, and uh, thank you for a great presentation. And basically, yeah, you answered. Can, 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 if you ask a question, can you can you um introduce yourself so I don't have to scroll through all yeah, the Yeah. Oh, sorry. I'm I'm Piot. I live okay. in U.S. in Texas. Nice. Uh, what was funny and great with your presentation that you answered all my questions. When I had a question, here you go. Okay. And with answer. The uh, one interesting thing that I realized that I started carving this spoon, the top 
of the bowl was longer. And once he explained the physics with the dagger, like while you were talking, I corrected. Yeah. Because I realized it was it ex extended too far and was going too much up. And yesterday I was looking at your early ice cream spoons, and yes, they have different shapes. Yes. And you explained the whole evolution. And so again, I really appreciate it. Yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. It's nice to hear. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? Any Could questions? You, here, sorry. Could you give some sort of measurement for what you think the thickness is at the tip of the bone? Well, uh, these are two different these are two different lengths here. So, uh, as I said, it's more of a I don't know. This pull out the ruler. So you not, know, this, not the this length. This is about like eight and a half inches. So or I got centimeters on this. You know, this I, I one. Think, I think she's wanting to know about the thickness at the back at the back of the bowl at the ah. like at the thickest part of the bowl. How thick no, would you say? No, at the tip of the bowl. Yeah. Oh, the tip. Yeah. The tip. Okay, the thickness of the tip of the bowl. Oh, that rim looks like it's a quarter centimeter. Quarter centimeter. Okay. Yeah. Did, yeah. Were you able to hear that, Rachel? Yeah, that's cool. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, like, just over a sixteenth of an inch is the, the rim thickness, but then it very quickly climbs to something more that I can't, I don't have calipers, so I can't tell you. Yeah. And I think that's important, you know, you want it to be fairly thin so that it can really dive down into the ice cream, otherwise it's, it's uh, it just takes more effort. And I mean, that's the thing that I think a lot of these, whether it's the functionality of the spoon itself or the way that it's, the when you're trying to carve around a surface, twice as much material really means twice as much force, twice as much force to push the knife through. And also if it's twice as thick at the tip, it's twice as much force to for, force, force it down through the ice cream. So a little change can make a big change in how it functions or how easily it is to carve, how easy it is to carve. So that was great. Any other questions, guys? I do, if you have time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you introduce yourself? Absolutely. My name's Nick Johnson. Nice. Um, I'm out here in Portland, Oregon. Nice. Um, so I'm having my breakfast while you're doing this. Um, um, I've I've noticed well, and see if this is something you agree with. Um, about half of the effort of being a better carver seems to be just having sharp tools, and mm -hmm. sharpening um, is <laughs> so hard. Yeah. Um, to get right. Um, yeah. It. You've talked. Is this is something you're going to cover in your next in in your magazine soon? I'm I'm going to talk about one particular aspect of it because um, okay. you're you're right. So yeah, I felt like I interrupted your question. So please continue. Or, um, or your oh no, not at all. I just I just okay. wanted to see. Oh, I was thinking about um, uh, uh, subscribing. And yeah. you wanted to ask about, you know, what, what you would be covering. Yeah, so, uh, so each issue of the magazine has an, um, an article that I write uh, that some aspect, some technical aspect of spoon carving. And again, this is just the way that I do it. I don't, I let other people, I try to highlight different people who have different ways of doing things. They have an article and I have an article. So there's just a, there's a breadth of ways to do things presented in each issue. Um, all of sharpening is too broad a topic to really cover. And in the past, I've covered a number of aspects of it. Um, particularly in the early issues, we covered some of the ways that Matt sharpened versus me. Um, this particular issue is just gonna talk about this one way of telling if you've gotten your edge geometry correct, because essentially, if you fail to get the edge geometry correct when you're sharpening, it doesn't matter what you do after that point, it won't be a good sharp edge. 
and it's very easy to not go quite enough with that coarsest grit and then to convince yourself that you should, yeah, it's good enough. I'll just start walking my way up through the grits and you'll get a nice polished edge, but it won't at the very, you know, magnified level at the very edge. It isn't what it should be. And so how do you tell when you've gotten it to the point where you can start walking up through your grits? Um, that's what I'm talking about in this current issue. And, and certainly my intent is to okay. hit different topics. Um, if you go back through my uh, Reels videos, back to when it was IGTV, I have many different videos describing my process of sharpening. But certainly, I, I feel your pain because I'm embarrassed how many more 106s I bought over the first couple of years just because I couldn't get them sharp enough. Um, and the time that I finally figured out my process to the point where I could get an edge that was sharper than the factory edge was mind-blowing. Um, yeah. And and, sure. and as you said, it, you know, 50% of carving is really about having a sharp knife. And there's so many details that go into whether your knife is sharp, like how often should you sharpen? How picky should you be about the wood that you carve? Like I don't try to carve across knots or anything with my knives because it's just not worth it. You know, I don't try and carve. I do have some walnut, but I, I'm loath to start carving it because it's just not worth it. You know, some walnut... Yeah really trash your edge some doesn't um and right but you just it really affects what you what you're you it's a terrible feedback loop it is it is and once it really starts to get out of control it's like it, the effort to get it back <laughs> is so intense i mean one of the simplest things you can do to really help yourself if you don't have this habit is to always keep sheaths on your knives if it's not in your hand it's in a sheath because I would have times where I just, you know, I'd knock my knife and it hit the coffee mug and I put yeah. a little ding in my edge. And then that's an hour of my time trying to get that cleaned up. And so um, it's, it's when you have a knife that you really, really like having those habits of maintaining it well, and then, and then having sort of the schedule at which you sharpen is really helpful. And, and certainly I think when you are carving mostly as like a therapeutic thing that you try to do, you don't want to spend your time sharpening, right? It's not, that's not serving the function that you're doing the thing for. And yet it's a necessary component. I find that I need to sharpen a knife after six to 12 spoons, depending on uh, how big the spoon is and how much, you know, how much I'm using the knife. So you're not talking um, about shopping, you're talking about sharpening. I'm, yeah, and I only strop after I sharpen. I don't strop in between spoons. I've tried all the different intervals. I've tried stropping in between every spoon. I've tried stropping multiple times. I've tried stropping every couple of spoons. Every time you strop, you're creating slightly more convexity, even if you're using Tom Scandian's uh, <laughs> Even if you've got really clean form, you're just, you're not a robot. And so you're gonna create some imperfections. And, um, and I found that then the more I stropped, it made sharpening harder because you're creating more of a secondary bevel that then needs to get removed when you're creating that perfect edge geometry. And so um, there was a trade-off. I could strop more and extend the life of the blade before I had to sharpen, but then sharpening was more painful. So what I've settled on now is every week I sharpen the knives that I use at any level. And if I've carved more than five things with a given knife, it gets goes all the way back to 400 grit. Um, you know, if I've, only carved, if I've only carved one or two spoons with it, I might just, you know, I might just drop it. But then I will keep in my mind that, you know, I better go and do that one properly next week. Quick interjection. Your oldest knife that you still use consistently how much metal have you taken off of that knife given how frequently you carve and sharpen? Yeah, so I have knives. Matt has a knife that he actually took back from me because I, he kept sending me knives a couple of years ago and I was like, yeah, it's not as good as the one I have. And finally it was like, I'm sending you one and you have to give me your old one. So you can't, and that one really got down to a splinter. But the this one that I have here is probably the thinnest at this point, which for comparison, with the freshest lost sheet. And how old is that one? Oh, 
two two years maybe and and it's you know it it doesn't it hasn't at this point i have enough knives that i'm not just using one knife and i'm carving enough that i'm using multiple knives so it's not like this would be even thinner if i wasn't using the other one more right but you know that's the comparison so they do wear out um, wow. you know and uh the funny thing is you you do get used to the state of your current knife where it is now i don't actually recommend hopping from knife to knife to knife because you do get tuned in to exactly where your knife is at and i also feel like especially if sharpening is a struggle or a pain or a chore in, in any way and it is for all of us but especially if you feel like you're getting inconsistent results having a, a roster of six knives that needs to be sharpened is much more painful than having one knife that needs to be sharpened yep um, and i'm definitely a victim of that because i've got way too many tools that yep. sharpening is so daunting i, I yeah. And it's and it sort of feels instead of feeling like this wonderful opportunity to have all these different knives, it feels like a, a weight around your neck of like, oh, I got to do all this stuff. So and a guilty feeling for having these beautiful blades sitting around that aren't really being used fully. So yeah. So on a on a typical so uh, on a typical week, I will sharpen say three sloids, two hooks, the axe, sometimes the draw knife, and it takes me. An hour and a half. Um, generally, the sloids, the thing that eats up a lot of time is if the sloids, if if they have that strong secondary bevel because I've half-assed it a handful of times mm -hmm. or overstropped, it just takes two, three, four times as long as it otherwise would. So it really is worth. Um, I don't know. I would recommend try not stropping except I, that's exactly where i am right now what's that that's exactly where i am right now mm -hmm. uh, with I, i've stopped for a while and i've got this really wonderful very heavy secondary bevel on my 106 <laughs> and um, so, so the other thing i would recommend that might be helpful is um i've tried all the different sharpening methods uh that are out there water stones diamond plates ceramic um, yep, same sticky, sticky back sandpaper on on glass i still find the best results from wrapping sandpaper around a wooden block there's something about it that is warm and tactile and i think part of it is the nature of the sandpaper and part of it is the fact that because it's not fixed to the block it actually pooches up a little bit there's always a little bit of airspace and you don't want a huge amount but it means that it's it's pressing against the the blade and so you always have really nice firm contact with the blade um which when it's when you have like sticky back sandpaper and it's down on a perfectly flat thing then unless you unless the knife is perfect you're not going to get perfect contact with the sandpaper because it's going to just lay there whereas oh, interesting sandpaper wrapped around the block it's like it's like a cushion it's like you're pushing into a cushion a little bit um huh. you're hitting that firm surface but you know those tiny little micro movements that you're making it's more forgiving and i found that 400 grit sandpaper just it's the fastest thing of all the things i've tried to get down through a secondary bevel um okay and okay i i do have like a continuous grit diamond plate like one of those really heavy ones um that i've used occasionally to to work my way back through a really convex uh bevel but um i just don't like it as i would rather spend more time with the 400 grit sandpaper it's the fastest thing that i've found and so that's the most encouraging for me all right thank you i appreciate that yeah of course any more questions guys hi any dominic question? <laughs> Yeah, who's, who's this? <laughs> yeah, this is Jeremy, uh, right? I'm from the Midwest, uh, Illinois in the United Probably. States. Um, yeah. And uh, my question is not so much about your spoon carving, but your podcasting uh, activities. So maybe this is- Sure, uh, yeah, sorry. I'm closer because uh, you're soft in the rooster society. You wanted to crow a bunch. Okay, 
Uh, and my question is, uh, when you're uh, deciding on a topic, how it sounds very much a one take when I'm listening to your podcast, uh, yep. uh, which is, you know, seems like it, but how much of your, how much do you prep for that? Because you're very frequent in your podcasting. They're very uh, tight in my mind as, as far as staying on topic and staying focused. Uh, but they're also very thoughtful in the way that they are uh, uh, on topics that are kind of discreet. Uh, and I'm just wondering either, hey, do you have a process for coming up with that topic? Uh, or, you know, or, or is it really just spur of the moment? Because it seems like there's some preparation, but not necessarily uh, a ton of preparation, if, if you, know, you get what I'm saying. I do, I do. Um, there's basically no preparation. Uh, basically, I have an idea. You generally, an idea will come to me and I'll write it down in the notebook. And so at any given time, I'll have a list of, you know, things that I, things in the notebook that I think I want to talk about. And, and often what will happen is something will happen and it'll make me think, oh, that's, you know, that's such a great example of this thing. So I'll write it down and I'll try and write down the thing that happened also, because I find that having the story hooks people into what I'm saying and it also helps me get into it because instead of having to come up with some preamble that lets me say the thing I can tell you the story and that lets me get into the thing and I find that I do need to be in the right headspace but generally speaking the two the two minute drive up to where I walk the dogs is is a good way to get to that headspace or even I'll, I'll often start talking before I get there. Cause I know I've just, I've got it. And I want to, I want to say it. Um, but sometimes I do do a podcast and I think oh, that really sucked, <laughs> but I try and put it that out there anyways. Occasionally I've had ones recently where I was like that. Ah, I didn't really, I was like too spacey too. There are too many long pauses. I lost my train of thought that's maybe one in 20 will be like that. And I'll generally jettison it and occasionally I'll redo it and try to make it better or realize that I spent all this time talking and realize that really I sort of talked my way around to the actual idea at the very end, but not in a good way. So I should redo it and just have it be a tighter thing with that. But I started the podcast really as a way to improve my um, public speaking skills because um, I was starting to have to do more of it. I, the book was coming out. I was starting to teach more. I was starting to teach publicly more and give talks and demonstrations. And I realized I was very uncomfortable with that and that the podcast was a way for me to practice doing that and to clean up my speech and to be able to think extemporaneously on my, my toes. And that the less I prepare, the better I get it. The more I'm trying to hold in my head of, I want to hit this point and this point and this point and say these specific words, the more I stumble over myself because I'm actually talking and thinking things through in the moment and you can tell. Um, so it, there's a certain amount of letting go that you have to do in order to do that. But certainly when I've given public talks, which feels much more daunting than a podcast, the best thing has been to do almost no preparation beforehand. And then I used to think that it was important for me to sort of stay in the zone and like not interact with people before the talk, but I've actually found that the opposite is true. That if instead I just interact with people, interact with people, interact with people, and they're like, oh, you're up. And I'm like, oh, okay. And then I get up and say, hey guys, and I just talk. It keeps me from getting into this thing where I stumble over myself because I've overthought it. Um, so, uh, yeah. And then certainly I was, I, yeah, I was given feedback early on. I was worried that me yelling at my dogs and saying hi to people as they drove by was problematic, but people said, no, no, they actually really like that. Um, and so I've come to embrace most of what happened. Sometimes if I'm, if I see someone walking towards me, I'll stop the podcast just so that I don't know what I'm going to say to them. I don't know if it's publicly appropriate, um, you know, or, or something <laughs> I keep private or, you know, I mean, not that I'm like swearing at people, but just I want to make sure that if I'm having a conversation with someone, it doesn't feel right to have what, what is a private conversation in public in what will be public. 
uh, mutters under so. his breath, "Oh, not this jerk." <laughs> Right. And I also like, frankly, if I had to, if I had to edit myself or even listen back to myself, I wouldn't do it. It would be, <laughs> it would lose the function of helping me get better at this thing and helping me think through these ideas. Um, and and it would instead become a thing that uh, put too many demands on my time. But as it is, I essentially record it. it takes thirty minutes to upload it, and that's it. And it is what it is. So I'm very honored you listen. Uh, thank you. I don't listen all the time, but because you do, you are pretty prolific and my podcast list is very long, but <laughs> the, um, the I, I, I am impressed by just the way that you, you, it sounds. And it sounds also like that, uh, very much like the repetition you get from your Spoon of the Month Club, that's kind of the key, yes. uh, that you're, it's by kind of focused effort on the consistency of doing the same thing repetitively, then now you have a groove and now you're getting to the the end state which is you know of course i don't know how many episodes you've 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 uh, released yes the very point, much but so. it's the same very, sort of thing. Very, very much a process over the product all right well i want to be conscious of the fact that we've been on here for two hours now so thank you so much emmett for the the generosity uh with your template with your time um really appreciate it for those who don't know by the way uh, you have, in some ways, Emmett to thank for Rise Up and Carve because it was part of his uh, virtual apprenticeship challenge that inspired me to start right. Rise Up and Carve almost four years ago. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for that, Emmett. And uh, we, we really yeah. appreciate it. With that, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording and, you know, take the template and run with it. Um...